Tonight, uh, we continue our 66 book series with the book of James. So we're going to be reading the whole book together, all five chapters. Uh, this, is, this book is a pastoral letter. It reads like a sermon. Uh, and just like in most sermons at Grace, we are going to take scripture and seek to understand it. However, most sermons at Grace Bible Church and most sermons in general take a very small section of Scripture. We dig deeply into one section to understand its parts. And Josh Kelso did that in a nine-part series back in 2019. I commend it to you. Uh, The women, many women here do it, gone through a Digging Deeper series, go deep into James in a a Bible study. It's It's a book that you can study and read on your own in a verse by verse manner. But what we do in the 66 book series and what I'm gonna do today, it's sort of like in Google Maps. If you search for a business or a home and you click and you you get the zoomed in view, that's, that's what we normally do. But sometimes it's helpful to hit that minus button, to zoom out, get the 33,000 feet or the 60,000 feet view where you can see how that single location sits within the neighborhood, sits within the city, the state, even the the country. It's helpful to zoom out and look at a whole book. So I I hope that this series is more than just the sermons you come and hear each night. It is incredibly helpful, so helpful. Something that I hope that each one of you are doing and do until the day that you die is read the whole Bible, study the whole Bible on your own. And these sermons that we've made it almost through the whole Bible now. They're online, they're in YouTube playlists, they're on our website. I hope that you use these on your own as you enter a book and you're gonna study it small parts, just like you might on Google Maps, zoom out. I hope that you use these to zoom out. And that's what I wanna help you see today. So many parts of James are our favorite parts, sections that can stand on their own and they're so rich, so deep. You could park there for a month on one paragraph and not exhaust it. But it is helpful to zoom out. That's what we're doing. So let's pray. Uh, One of the commands that is so clear in the book of James is that we be doers of the word and not hearers only. Every one of us here is going to hear from God's word, but apart from his grace and his Holy Spirit active in us, we will not be able to ultimately be doers of the word. We need his help. We who hear and how much more he who speaks need help. So let's pray and then we're going to get started. God, I I pray for your Holy Spirit to be active, active as I speak that my words would be accurate, that they would be helpful. God, that you would take your words and drive them deep, split us apart, open us up to the very core of who we are and change us, affect us. The, The very theme of this book is that we cannot be unaffected by your word and it must indeed, it must indeed affect and change every single aspect of our life. So God, I pray that you would do that. I pray that we would listen carefully, that when we see change that needs to be made, that we would do it. Where we see something about you and your character that needs to affect the way that we live, we would walk in that. God, I pray that we would not be able to leave this room tonight, this reading of your word tonight, unaffected. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. So open your Bible to James chapter 1. Uh, James chapter 1. You're going to see me reading big chunks of Scripture today. Don't tune out. That is the real sermon. My words are commentary on this. Sometimes you can tune out. Okay, let's wait. We're going to get to the sermon. We have to read that. We're going to go. Th- we are going to read the entire book of James bit by bit. And Listen carefully. I'm going to be reading from the ESV. That's the version that I have studied and memorized in. 
it's just hard for me to read from something else. I'll screw it up. So I know that that's different than the verse you might have in your lap. That might be a feature. So you can just sit and listen. And before we get, before we start reading, I want you to understand who James is. So you understand this is a pastoral admonition to believers. And I I want you to understand, uh, Understanding who James is might help you understand his words to you in a way that might uh, affect you better. So you see that the, the book starts, James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, verse one. James, he says he is a slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He identifies himself as James. And then in the next verse, he says he's writing to the 12 tribes who are in the dispersion or the diaspora. That, that word, uh, it became a technical name by this time for all the Jewish, all the nations in which Jews resided outside of Palestine. They came to live in a dispersion. It's the dispersion that was promised in Deuteronomy 28. If you remember, there were blessings and there were curses. Uh, and God promised that he would in response to Israel's disobedience, disperse them. And one day he would regather his scattered people from among the nations. James is writing to Jews scattered. And he is writing from the home base, Jerusalem. He is the the pastor of the church. He is the leader of the church in Jerusalem, made up primarily of Jews, writing to Jews who have now believed in Jesus probably about a decade, maybe a decade and a few years more after Jesus died and rose from the dead. That regathering of Jews hadn't yet happened. It still hasn't happened. And so James was writing, he was used to being a pastor toward Jesus believing Jews there in Jerusalem, but he knew there were others scattered abroad that needed to hear his pastoral admonition. And so, so he writes that. Who is this James? He identifies himself as a a slave of God and a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not the James, the Peter James and John James. This is a a different James. This was James who's mentioned in Matthew 13, 55, Mark 6, 3 as Jesus's brother. Mary was not a perpetual virgin the way that the Catholic Church incorrectly, falsely teaches. Uh, not yet on the slides. I'm still on intro. So James was, was Jesus's brother, his half-brother. He had other brothers, Joseph, Jude, and Simon. Uh, Jude is, is the, the guy who wrote the, the second to the last book in the Bible. And, and James, you can imagine, he grew up with the sinless Lord. You might imagine that he would say, James, the brother of Jesus Christ. He didn't say that. He said, James, the slave of Jesus Christ. And what's interesting is if you note the, actually more than almost any other book in the New Testament, James consistently and continually refers to his, the recipients of the letter as brothers. He says, don't listen to me because I'm Jesus's brother. We all are Jesus's brother. I'm writing to you as a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to see that echoed later. Uh, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. We are all brothers. And and maybe any benefit that I might have had growing up with Jesus, I'm going to depreciate that. I'm a slave of of Jesus. And this James, uh, the other James, the Jesus... Peter, James, and John, James, he was beheaded by by Acts 12. And we see in that same chapter, this James, James, Jesus's brother, who actually there's no evidence believed in Jesus while Jesus was still on earth, at least until after his resurrection. Uh, This James likely believed after Jesus appeared. When we hear that in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Paul specifically calls out that Jesus appeared to Peter and then James. And now we see in Acts 1, James, this James, is with all the believers in the upper room. He's there. And by Acts 12, he's a leader in Jerusalem. This is probably about 10 years, 15 years after Jesus' death. And by Acts 15, which is probably after he wrote this book, 
James is clearly the, the key leader in the Jewish church at Jerusalem. So like I said, James, the, the leader of the Christian Jews from the, the lead pastor, Paul calls him a pillar. He's writing to all the Jews who believe in Christ spread throughout the diaspora. And in the very early days of the church, as the gospel spread to the Gentiles, you could see that there was a need to understand what true faith was. You had Jews who maybe were used to relating to the law in a way that faith wasn't ever, in, or that, that they were never intended to. Some Jews, you saw this in the, uh, the Jewish leaders that killed Jesus, their response to the law wasn't faith. They, they held up something different. And G Gentiles, they didn't ever relate to the law at all. So they didn't know how to relate to God's word. And so there was need to clarify Christians who say that they have faith. What does that faith actually look like? And so James writes, he writes for pastoral concerns for the scattered church, and he writes describing and encouraging the church to live out a genuine faith that will survive testing actually flourish under testing, be matured under testing, and survive until the end of their life so that they can receive the crown of life that's promised to all those who endure. So, book of James, you can go up to the first slide. It doesn't have a strict outline. It's, it's not like Paul who tends to build an argument. We see a lot of theological truths and then commands. Rather, James is it's more, it's not a theological treatise or a logical argument, but it's really a pastoral letter, a sermon, a pleading. Chapter one serves as an intro for the book, and it addresses all of the themes that will later be addressed. And so you can see that here. You see if genuine faith, James says, is going to be marked by testing under trial, godly wisdom, prayer and trust, humility, a proper view of riches and poverty, response to God's word, use of the tongue, impartial love, concern for the needy, rejecting worldliness. If you know the book, that sounds like an outline of the second of the chapters two through five, but it's also the order of things presented in chapter one. So James doesn't make this strict outline that he's going to follow. He sort of makes introduction and then follows the same outline, but always calling back to the previous themes. And it's really interesting to study this book next to the Sermon on the Mount, because you just hear echoes of Jesus, sometimes just straight up quotes, and just, you can't help but go a couple verses without saying, Jesus said that, Jesus said that. It sort of makes sense. He grew up with Jesus. And he grew up with Jesus, seeing people around Jesus, hearing the word preached, James is probably one of them who then went away unaffected. They heard the word. They weren't doers of the word. And James says, Christians, you must not be like that. Genuine faith must mark you in every aspect of your life. Let me plead with you. Let me admonish you. Let me describe for you what genuine faith is. And so, next slide, we're, we're going to take a easier to preach order, which is just front to back through the book. But it's, it's maybe not quite like the, the outline is going to say, because you're going to hear it constantly going back to, oh yeah, he just talked about that back in chapter one. He talked about that in chapter one and two and three and four and five. You just see the same themes going over and over again. So I, I want to help you if you're studying on your own to not think of this merely as a building outline or a theological argument, but, but an introduction followed by a, a progression that, that continues to apply those teachings to life. So finally, now let's open up. Let's look at James 1 verse 2. James starts his book and he says, genuine faith, next slide, genuine faith will pass the test of perseverance in suffering. And this really is the theme of the book. This is the bookend. You'll see it at the beginning and then you see it at the end. 
you must persevere in suffering, but not in suffering and trial only. You must actually persevere in faith in all of life, but especially in suffering, especially in trial. Let's read verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. When God saves a person by grace through faith, whether it was in the first few years of the church, remember, this, Jesus had only been dead for, and, and alive for 15 years, 10, 15 years at this point, or 2,000 years later, that faith will be seen. That faith must be seen. A testing of faith proves its genuineness. Like Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourselves, same word, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves, because don't you know you'll pass the test if Jesus is in you? This isn't like a test where you just constantly are thinking, oh man, I don't know if I'm in the faith. I don't know if I'm in the faith. I, work in, I'm, I serve in student ministries, and students are always asking me, can you help me know if I'm a Christian? James's answer for that will be, do you believe? Then live like it. Test yourself. If you see something inconsistent, we're going to see repent, turn. But don't be paralyzed by analysis. Rather, count it joy when you're tested, because if Jesus is in you, you pass the test. And if you don't, we're going to see in chapter 4, it's an opportunity to repent. Or Hebrews 11 by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, you'll see James refer to this, tested in Hebrews 11, same word. This is exactly what James refers to in 2.21. Abraham's faith was proven through testing. And you can't help but think of Hebrews 4.15, Jesus. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who was what? Our high priest, Jesus, was tested, tempted, it's same word, in all things, yet he was without sin. So count it all joy when you're tested because you're being made like Jesus. You're not going to pass the test quite like he did, but as years go by and testing more and more and more, you're going to be shaped. You're going to be matured. You're going to be made complete, lacking in nothing. This doesn't mean you're going to be sinless. You see this in, in verse 3 and 4. The testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Steadfastness matures you, completes you. And I'm slowing down here because this is a common word throughout and a common idea that you have to get in the introduction to the book. Think of a, a sculptor, God being the sculptor in your life. And he has a, a purpose. When, he, when, he, when a, a master sculptor takes a slab of marble and starts chipping away, and polishing. He has a, a vision in mind that doesn't quite look like yet. If you've ever seen a sculptor work or a, a really good artist, you're drawing, he's like, what are you going to do? And then as it starts to take form, you're just amazed. Oh, that's why that piece had to come off. That's why you had to take the hammer to that part. And that hurts when you're the marble and you have to have pieces chipped off. But James says, count it all joy when you face trials, because as you endure those trials, you're going to get steadfastness. And steadfastness is going to have its full effect, its perfect effect. You may be perfect and complete. Again, that perfect isn't sinless. That perfect is, is, is a complete wholeness that you're being formed into, lacking in nothing. You how can you count joy in trials? We're going to see some of the trials here is even suffering unto death. There's all kinds of trials that you're going to face in life. And that's why he says, don't just count it all joy in the big trials or the small ones or in the really spiritual ones, but in every trial, all kinds. Because as your faith is tested, you're being formed into the very godly man or woman that God saved you to be. We are joyful in life when we get what we want most. And as we're going to see in a few verses, if you're 
holiness, if your faith endures, you're going to get the crown of life, eternal life with God. That is what, if your faith is real, if you're not living for this world, but you're living for God, that's what you want most. So when you get tested, praise God. Praise God. He is doing that for your good. Every good gift, especially the hard ones, are coming from God who doesn't change. All right, so have you ever cried out to God and said, God, I am so tired of being sinful and weak. Please help me get rid of my sin. Sanctify me, mature me. That is the heart cry of every adopted son in God's family. And trials are God's answer. Trials of various kinds are God's answer to that prayer. And it's his means of sanctifying you. So as we face those trials, the testing of our faith, you will endure, but you won't endure apart from actually enduring. It's not automatic. It's inevitable for God's children, but it's not automatic. And you will feel your need. And that need, you're going to say, man, I need wisdom to know how to endure. Look down, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, which will be made so evident in the face of so many trials, let him ask God. It gives generously to all without reproach. And it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Do you see how even the trial that makes you realize your need, your dependence, that tests your faith to see how am I going to pray? Am I going to pray with faith? Yeah, you, you will if this faith is from the Lord. But let, let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. You're going to see this theme in James. You can't have it both ways. You can't be faithful and faithless at the same time. You can't say, I have faith and have no evidence of faith. You can't say, I love my neighbor and don't love him. You can't say, my heart and therefore my tongue have been changed and then speak cursing. You can't say, I love God and love the world at the same time. You can't say, I trust in God the judge and then take vengeance. This is a theme consistent. You can't have it both ways and you can't ask God for things and say, I don't know if he's good enough or powerful enough to give it. If you ask like that, that's not the kind of faith that we'll receive because it's not a faith that trusts in this unchanging, good God who is your father. So as we face those trials, the testing of our faith, don't put confidence in your riches. And don't despair if you're poor, right? Because your confidence, you're, as you ask God for things in prayer, you're going to realize, oh, I shouldn't have confidence in how much money I have, and, and I shouldn't give up if I don't have any physical blessing now. The true blessing that eclipses any worldly riches and it trumps any poverty is the crown of life that God gives to his children to those who love him and who remain steadfast under testing. Let's read James 1, 9 through 12 and see that. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Seen through eyes of faith, it's the great normalizer. These things, this worldly, living for the world, uh, you do not live for the world and live for God simultaneously. But living for God, you see the temporary, temporary nature of this world. And you realize that because like a fl flower of the grass, the rich man and really all men will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and beauty perishes. So also the rich man will fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. You'll see James often refer to the rich man 
this would be shorthand for typically the, the rich man who trusts in his riches. And Jesus said it's, it's very hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's possible. With God, all things are possible. It's, it's really hard because you can't love both God and money. So if you have money or you don't, show your faith by not living for that money. So second, genuine faith passes the test of relating to God appropriately in sin or temptation. God does not intend testing as temptation. God intends something in your testing. He doesn't intend sin. Interesting here, the, the word translated temptation, it can mean temptation to sin or testing. And it's the same word as the testing of your faith. Um, if you sin when you are tested, that comes from you, not God. Do not blame him is what James says. Verse 13, let's read. James says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation, no shadow, due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. God doesn't change. God intends holiness for his children. He intends the testing of your faith. Just like Jesus went through some hard things, he, he didn't intend that for Jesus to sin, but rather for Jesus to prove himself faithful in that. He doesn't intend testing and opportunities for you to sin as actual opportunities to sin, but rather the, the arena in which your faith is proven. Have you ever said when somebody says, how are you doing? And you say, I'm really struggling with this sin. And that's shorthand for I'm actually sinning. <laughs> that's, that's what maybe James's readers are, are thinking here is uh, there's temptation to sin. I'm, maybe that's just God's lot in, my, in life for me. You, you hear this in, in arguments today about homosexuality. God made me like this, or I'm just an anxious person. It's inevitable. I'm struggling with lust right now. That's embedded in me. It's just, it's how God made me. That is how God, that was your old unmixed condition. But for the child of God, when you are facing a trial and you respond in sin, don't, don't blame God for that. You, you see, that came from within you. And by chapter 4, we're going to see what you should do with that. Instead, when you have opportunity under testing to sin, what should you do? Obey. Endure. Look at God and say, God, you are unchanging in this. Every good gift Every perfect gift. This isn't just saying, oh, when I win the lottery, that came from God because every good gift came, came from God. Thank you. If you get something really good, say thank you, God. That was from you. But if you get persecuted, if you get an opportunity to obey or disobey, if you, and we're going to see lots of those in this book, you can look at that and say, God, you are unchanging. You are good and you do good. And the exact circumstance I'm walking in is part of your unchanging gift to me. His intention is not that you sin, but that you endure. In God's sovereign, unchanging fatherly rule, all things are good for his children. Or they're going to work together for good and they're perfect gifts from God even when people sin against you. He doesn't give a good gift one day and a bad gift the next. If you ask him for wisdom, you ask him, God, get me out of this trial. Will you please get me out of this trial and please give me the wisdom? And he 
says, no, not yet. His nature didn't change. You can count it all joy because you say, all right, this isn't sin that you are accomplishing in me. This isn't uh, suffering merely for, for suffering's sake. This isn't, uh, this isn't something bad ultimately that's happening to me, but it is in your sovereignty being used for my maturing, my sanctification, so that in the final day, I will get the crown of life promised to all who love you. Third, genuine faith passes the test of responding properly to God's word. As I'm, as I'm going through this, I, I plead with you, do not say, all right, what's the next point? Good, I got that. I mentally assent. Say, I must have my life scrutinized by this. How do I respond with opportunity to sin? How do I respond with God's word in front of me? And that is where James goes. He, you are the only way that you will possibly remain steadfast under trial and receive the, the crown of life. The only way that you'll respond to opportunity to sin with holiness will be by being a doer of the word and not a hearer only. You must read God's word. You must be familiar with God's word. But reading it is not sufficient. It is, however, necessary. You must read God's word and be a doer of it, putting away sin and pursuing the good works that should flow by faith. Let's read James's admonition. We're going to finish out the chapter here. And this is all under, when you read God's word, do it. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Every interaction with a person is an opportunity to sin. God's not giving you that to sin. He's, he's, giving, it, you, he's giving you a chance to actually receive the implanted word and uh, be a doer of the word. Therefore, continues, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he's religious and doesn't bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that's pure and undefiled before God is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress. If you hear God's word, you hear a chance to obey or you see sin exposed and you go away unaffected, you're, you're basically like somebody who goes and looks in the mirror and you see a booger in your nose and you walk away and don't do anything about it. The mirror didn't do you any good. God's word does not do you any good if you don't respond in obedience and faith. And note that James calls the word in 125, and he repeats this in 212, he calls it the law of liberty. For the Christian, God's word actually frees you from the bondage. When God saves you by grace, he changes you from the heart. He frees you from the bondage to sin and a hopeless inability to obey God. He frees you from the heart to love and respond to God's word with faith. Jesus said, everyone who practices sin is a slave of sin. But if the son sets you free, you're free indeed. That, means, that doesn't mean that you're free from the requirement to follow God's rules, to follow God's commands, to obey his word. But now you're freed to obey. Remember what I said about James 1 being an intro to the whole book. We've now seen all of the topics pretty much addressed. And now we're going to jump in and we see all right, that the main point here is that testing of faith is an opportunity to endure. 
And we do it for the crown of life. And you do it in all of life as a response to God's word. It must inter- affect your words, it must affect your actions, and it must really affect the way you interact with other people, especially believers. And so now we go to chapter two. Genuine faith passes the test of impartial, merciful love. Genuine faith will love like Jesus with impartiality and mercy. Look for that here. Genuine faith will love with impartiality and mercy. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, stand over there, sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you've dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones who oppress you, the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court, are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law's transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. And if you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. Judgment is without mercy to the one who shows no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I hope you're convicted by that making distinctions. We might not say rich people sit over here and poor ones over there, but you've probably come to church and chosen the the people who are going to serve you well. You've made distinctions and not seen things through God's eyes. Realize that if you don't love your neighbor perfectly, you are now guilty of breaking the law before God. You are a lawbreaker, and God will either hold you accountable for all of that or show you mercy. When you realize that this is the gospel, right? For those who turn in faith to Jesus, he has forgiven you such an immense debt. He says Jesus is the Lord of glory. We've sinned against that one. In the parable of the unforgiving servant is, should be evident here. How could you be forgiven 10,000 lifetimes of debt and not be merciful to another? Or how could you be adopted as sons and heirs of the kingdom and then make distinctions on these earthly terms? Don't look at each other any way except through eyes of faith. And James is, remember, he's writing to scattered Jews and many of them used to relate to the law inappropriately, seeking to be justified or declared holy by keeping it. This should break them of any notion that that's even possible. You break one point, you're guilty of all of it. You're not getting justified there. And this proves the futility of trying to be justified, right? If If you break one part of the law, you are condemned as a lawbreaker and responsible for all. We are justified by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. But there's a distortion of that response that says, okay, I'm no longer dependent, or I never was, dependent on obeying law. I'm saved by grace, so obedience maybe doesn't matter. And it's this confusing distortion that James goes on to address next. One might say, I have faith in Jesus, therefore I'm saved. Don't judge me. Yeah, don't, don't judge. Put yourself up over them as judge, but, but God will. What kind of faith will stand before God the judge and ultimately be declared? Yeah, that's the, that's the faith I justify. It's the one that is accompanied by works. 
And so let's, let's read James 2.14 and 26, where James puts forward a hypothetical claim of faith and says, will that faith save? What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but doesn't have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you, you believe that God is one, you do well, but even the demons believe that and they shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. The scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works? when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. This isn't a repudiation of the doctrine of justification by faith alone, but a clarification of it. We are indeed saved by grace, but he's holding up scripture and saying, don't you see what faith accomplishes? It accomplishes works. You can't be a hearer and say, yep, I know God's one. I know who God is, but not do it. You can't do that. A faith that knows who God is and responds in faith will live out that faith, like Abraham, like Rahab, and like every brother and, Christ, brother and sister in Christ must. Genuine faith will pass the test of works. Similarly, genuine faith will pass the test in words. A, a tested faith that endures will be made complete to show its evidence in the way that we speak, right? What was the effect of trials on us? Steadfastness, you're going to be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Look at, look at this section in 3.2. James says that a man who doesn't stumble in what he says... He's perfect, same word. He's a mature, complete, perfect man. His uh, sanctification is accomplished. This isn't meant to cause us to be discouraged of ever gaining control of our tongues, but to realize the importance of it. Out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks. So for faith to prove itself genuine, look at your tongue. Look what comes out of your mouth, and that will reflect what's going on in your heart. Let's read 3, 1 through 12 together. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouth of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue. It's a small member, but it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life. And it's set on fire by hell for every kind of beast and bird, of reptile sea creature. Those can be tamed. They've been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or grapevine figs? No, neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. You can't change your heart. God must. And if your tongue is different, it's evidence that God changed you from the heart. Pure or genuine faith that will pass the test is evidenced 
through words that are affected by faith. Brothers, James pleads, demonstrate genuine faith by be, being a doer of the word with your tongue. And then genuine faith will pass the test of godly wisdom. Just as in Proverbs, fear of the Lord distinguishes the wise from the fool, here genuine faith will be distinguished or set apart from earthly wisdom by the works that flow from it. Verse 13 we're going to see that true wisdom is not primarily something you know, just like faith isn't something you know, but it's something that you do flowing from who you know. Read that here with me in 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works and meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom that's from above is first pure and then peaceable and gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. If there's jealousy, selfish ambition, if there's fights among you, where is that coming from? It's not coming from the wisdom that comes from faith. Just like if you sin in a trial, that's not coming from God. It's coming from within you. And that's where James goes next in 4, 1 through 12. When you see worldliness... When you see the things that flow from worldliness, those are fights, quarrels, it's because you're in love with the world. 4.1, what causes quarrels? What causes fights among you? It's this, it's your passions that are at war within you. You desire and you don't have, so you murder. You covet, covet and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. You don't have because you don't ask, and you ask and you don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, you double-minded people, he would say from 1.5, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it's to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. If you see sin in yourselves, if you see that you're loving the world, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. That's grace. Don't speak evil against one, another's, one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law but if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's only one lawgiver. There's one judge. He who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? So then Jesus goes on. You, you can't serve two masters, right? Jesus says you can't serve two masters. You're going to, if you are having worldly wisdom come out of you, it's evidence that you're in love with the world. So as you go about doing things in the world, do it with dependence, recognizing that you are not God. God is. So when you go, verse 13, into a town, when you make a plan, and you say, I'm going to spend a year and trade and make a profit, yet you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, 
for him it is sin. Similarly, don't make oaths or promises. That's what he says in 5.12. Don't swear either by heaven or earth, but let your yes be yes and your no be no so that you don't fall into condemnation. Would we respond to opportunities before us in the world with faith? We're not going to love the world and we're going to hold our plans loosely. When we see that we've sinned, either by making promises we can't keep, making plans thinking that we're God, or God forbid, living in love with the world and realizing that we are adulterous people, weep, mourn, repent. Because that God gives grace to the humble. But what about those who do live for the world? Does God, they seem to be getting away with it. We're going to see in, in 5, 1 through 11, we're going to see the, this first part of 5, God does see. Does God, does Jesus care about justice? When the world says eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but Jesus says, don't resist the one who is evil. Does that mean Jesus doesn't care? God doesn't care? That couldn't be further from the truth. The judge is standing at the door. The judge sees it. And because the judge sees, Christian, you can persevere without feeling the need to judge yourself, without feeling the need to get revenge, but entrusting yourself and your future to the judge. So first he addresses in James 5, the sinful rich who maybe got rich through keeping back money, Uh, through living for themselves, for persecuting others, for stealing. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. They will come. Your riches have rotted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud. They're crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts, of armies. You have lived in luxury and in self-indulgence and fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You've condemned and murdered the righteous person. And that righteous person follows Jesus' command to not resist the evil one. But now you righteous ones, you ones who are living by faith, be patient until the Lord comes. Just like the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives the early and late rains, you also, brothers, be patient. Establish your hearts. The coming of the Lord is at hand. Don't grumble against each other so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. The judge is coming. You don't have to reciprocate evil for evil. And the judge is coming. Don't play judge yourself. Consider, as an example of suffering and patience, I take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've heard the purposes of the Lord, how he is compassionate and merciful. And finally, the one who is... So it... If, if you are, have the eyes of faith, you can endure even persecution, even wickedness against you because you know that the judge is there. And if you have the eyes of faith, you, you won't sin against your brother by grumbling or judging against him because you don't want to be condemned yourself. The judge is at the door. Jesus is coming very, very soon. And because Jesus is coming Genuine faith will be a praying faith, a praying faith marked by repentance. If anyone among you is suffering, let him pray. If they're suffering, you will pray. But what if things aren't that bad? What if you're cheerful? Things are good. What does it say here? Let him sing praise. That's just another form of prayer, thanksgiving to God. God didn't change. What if you're sick? This is a hard word. This, it might be that you're sick or, or maybe even just weary. 
beat up through the trials of life. This, this word can be translated weary. It actually is in weary or weak. It is in all of the other uses in the epistles. So I, I would suspect that's a, a better translation here. Is anyone among you weak? And you're so weak, you can't pray? Have you ever found yourself there where you're like, I know I should pray, I just don't have the energy. This is for you. Let him call for help. Call for the elders. Pray at all times. And let the elders pray over him. So if you're suffering, pray. If you're cheerful, pray. If you can't pray yourself because you're so weak, call for help. Get the elders there and let them pray. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is weary. And the Lord will, wait, will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. This can't be the prayers of the elders. This is the elders came, prayed with him, and, and he was restored to be able to pray in faith again. Elders, that's your job. When you get a call from somebody, I can't pray, I need help, go. How do we keep ourselves from being in that position? Therefore, this is what it says next, how do you keep yourself from being in a position where your endurance is threatened? You almost can't even pray because you're so weak. It's what we do at small groups. Confess your sins, pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Don't neglect praying for each other. And that healing that is promised is more like a by his stripes you're healed a relief from the consequences and power of sin. And James ends with an example of a faithful man who prayed, Elijah. Do you remember he, he prayed that it wouldn't rain? Smed talked about that this morning. Why did he pray it wouldn't rain? Because his nation was sinning. The, 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 rain, the lack of rain, the prayer for lack of rain wasn't to be mean. It wasn't to cause a drought, but it was to cause repentance. God loves to answer prayers like that. Elijah was a righteous man who prayed for his people. And you remember there's fire down, they killed all the prophets, and, and there, was, there was repentance for a time. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed fervently that it might not rain. For three years, six months, it didn't rain. And then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. And there's a conclusion. The beginning of the book says, count it all, all joy when you face trials, because as you endure those trials, you're going to be made mature. And at the end, what if you find yourself not enduring, but then somebody goes and gets you and turns you back? It's not hopeless. If you're not enduring, like James says, don't give up, but don't waste the opportunity tonight to respond in faith. If anyone, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and somebody brings him back, the one who brings back a sinner from his wandering soul, like the elder who goes to the weak one, or the one who prays like Elijah and turns him back, will save his soul from death and cover over a multitude of sins. The faith that saves isn't the perfect faith, but it's the faith that endures, the faith that returns when there's sin, the faith that's a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Let's pray. God, I pray if there are any here who are wandering from the truth, if there's any here who know this truth, but they know their life isn't consistent with the faith they claim, God, I pray that they would turn now. And even this message from James could be said to save that person's soul from death, an eternal death, so that they would get the crown of life that is promised to all who love you, all who endure. We love you. We need you. This kind of faith could only come from you. Please provide it. In Jesus' name, amen.